Hi, I'm Pia Chattopadhyay sitting in for Anna Maria Tremonti, and you're listening to The Current. All right, still to come, it is one of the most buzzed about media companies of the digital age, and BuzzFeed is finally setting up an official Canadian outpost. I'll speak with Craig Silverman, the Canadian journo, who will be at the helm of BuzzFeed Canada, about making CanCon go viral. But first, if only it was only a dream. I have a whole fantasy world that I've been building since I was nine and I'm almost 35. I mean, these characters have grown up with me and I have a core cast of characters and then they've expanded as they've grown and gotten married and met people. And I mean, some of them work in the government. It could be them, you know, adopting a new child, having an intense conversation with their friends. I try, I've tried multiple times trying to kind of write it down, but it's, it goes into this person's history and that person's history and characters come back practically from the dead and I start rewriting, you know, ancestors and I, there are just so many elaborate stories over the years. Mm. It sounds like a rich and elaborate imaginative world, perhaps the basis for a sprawling novel or an engrossing TV series. But for Cadelia Rose, these characters are her daydreams and they're also her life. Now it's constantly playing in the background and I'll see something, you know, kind of make me go into it. It's always there. It's very um, emotional, intellectual. Cordelia Rose has what some refer to as maladaptive daydreaming. This is where an active imagination becomes more than a distraction, and it can be debilitating. For most of my life, it was my main reality. It's not even a fantasy world. It was reality, and it sucked me in, and I couldn't get out. And I spent many years where it sort of crippled me, and I couldn't interact with people. I couldn't function. I wasn't aware of my surroundings at all. I would often find myself completely disoriented and stepping off into traffic. I, at one time, I, I started to cross the bridge as it was lifting, and people had to, like, tell me, stop, stop, and I wasn't even aware. All right, well, to gain more insight into what's called maladaptive daydreaming, we're joined first by someone who can relate to what Cordelia Rose describes. Jane Biggleson is a former maladaptive daydreamer who's now involved in researching the condition, and she's in New York City. Jane, good morning. Good morning. So as you hear Cordelia Rose talk about her experiences there, her life, what resonates for you? I mean, I had such similar experiences as a child, maybe not quite to the same degree, but a constant feeling that uh, my daydreams were taking over and it, that it was hard to focus on real life. Um, and I spent so much of my childhood and my young adulthood trying to find someone like me um, and asking for help, and no one heard of such a thing. So so take us into your world. You were a maladaptive daydreamer for, for most of your life. What, what was your fantasy world... I don't know if that's the right word, fantasy world, but what was that like? You know, it started when I was very young, and one of the days I vividly remember was I had watched a Brady Bunch marathon, um, and it was just one rerun after another, and I got annoyed. I'm like, why is there not a new one on the show? And uh, my sister said to me, well, there's never going to be a new one on. That show's not on the air anymore. Um, and I got annoyed, so I said, okay, I'm going to make my own show. Um, and then the next thing I knew, I was in my front yard, pacing in circles for hours where I created my own episodes of the Brady Bunch, where I became the seventh Brady, where they went on vacation with me. It was one adventure after another. Um, and before I knew it, it had been like several hours. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, I don't think it was a problem. I think at that time, I think it was a lot of fun and it was enjoyable and it was creative and I only did it when I had nothing else to do. But as I got a little older, it started to take over my life. Well, And, and we'll get to that in a second, but at the, at, how, much, how much time are you spending? You, you, you know, illustrate what you're doing in terms of pacing back and forth on, on the driveway. That went on for hours that day. But how much of your time were you living in this, this other world? And so, I mean, that took a turn when I was when I was a young child. The, one, the the those Brady Bunch, Little House on the Prairie years. That was only when there was nothing else to do. If I didn't have friends over, I couldn't find something else to do, and it would be maybe a few hours at a time. Um, but as I got older, I learned to do it without the pacing, and then it really could be all day, every day. Um, I could be out with friends, and I would be half listening to friends and half creating stories in my head. Um, and to me, that's when the real problem came, because instead of being isolated hours at a time, it, it became all day, every day. All day, every day. This is all you did, really. Yeah. I mean, I, you still have attention. Um, I, 
on the real world. You know when you need to get something done. I was a good student. I had friends. I was involved in activities. But I always had my half my eye on the real world. Um, when I had to take a test, that got my full concentration. But I always knew, okay, I can take a break now. Um, and I was always going back. Every moment of the day, I was going back and forth, seeing if I could get away. And, and are you aware while you're sort of going back and forth, like, hey, I should pull myself out of this? How, how easy was it to say, okay, I need to concentrate on reality now instead of this other world that I have? Oh, I mean, I'm so aware. I mean, it was a constant awareness. I would know. I mean, I even did this through law school, and I would know there were times in law school where you absolutely had to pay attention in class, and then there were times when your classmates would start to ask silly questions that you knew would never be on the exam, and you're like, oh, I can get a few minutes in here now, but you mm -hmm. always had one eye on when you really needed to pay attention. Um, but it's diff so you always knew, but it's difficult to limit. And I was constantly trying to tell myself, you need to do less of this. You need to do less of this. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just too tempting. And what was it about this this world, this other world, that, that you so preferred? I think it was just it was more interesting. Um, you certainly have complete control over it. Um, it got to the point where I could, you know, I could cry and I could laugh um, frequently. Maybe I watched a little too much television as a kid, but I remember being, you know, annoyed at certain shows. I was watching soap operas, I think I was watching General Hospital at the time, and, and they would take forever to for the have the reunited scene that I'd want to see. And I'd be like, okay, I don't have to wait for them to write it. I can watch it in my head exactly how I want it. So I think it was the control. Hmm. At its peak, how debilitating was this for you? You know, for me, um, it's hard to point to an overt uh, negative consequence of it because I, I really did overcompensate. So I would pay not a ounce of attention in class in high school, but then the day before the test, I would force myself to learn everything. Um, so if you looked at my life, it would be hard to say that this was really a problem because, I, again, I did well. I had friends, all of that. But I just felt exhausted. Um, I would stay up all night doing it. Um, it was a, just this constant trying to battle the two. The two. Mm -hmm. And there people will say that, you know, again, they don't see any problem with it. I did fine, but I just remember it feeling very exhausting. Jane Bigelson, stay with us because I, I, I do want to hear how you eventually were treated, but I want to bring someone else into our conversation. Ellie Summer is the first healthcare professional to study maladaptive daydreaming. He is a clinical psychologist teaching at the University of Haifa, and he joins us from Haifa, Israel. Ellie, hello. Hi. Okay, so you coined this term maladaptive daydreaming. Explain to me what exactly is going on. Well, uh, we are still looking at it to, try to understand, but um, I think my hunch is that people, certain people have a, a, an inborn capacity to fantasize very vividly uh, in, to the extent that they get a sense of presence that they're actually there. So it is very much unlike regular uh, mind wandering or thinking about a conversation that I had with somebody or planning one. It is actually a, se a, a sense of full immersion, full absorption in an alternate reality. And apparently people have various capacities to do that. So that's one condition, of course. And then when people discover that they can do it, um, it is so much fun that they tend to develop a sort of an addiction to it. Uh, but when you factor in uh, adverse uh, life conditions, uh, uh, childhood adversity, such as uh, child sexual abuse or neglect, or other psychological problems, such as um, uh, shyness or you know, social phobia, uh, that make it difficult to, to interact and to cope in the real world, uh, people then tend to prefer the uh, the fantasy world. I want to take a step back, though, for for a moment, Ellie, because there are people who say, well, my, my kid does that, and he or she just has this wild imagination of living in a fantasy world, or an adult is sitting there saying, well, I do that. I'd much prefer to live in my alternate reality, and, and I do that. So just... Just really clarify the difference between a maladaptive daydreamer and the regular sort of daydreaming or imaginations that, that we all have. Yes. Well, I think the, 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 the two uh, speakers that you had before me um, illustrated it very well. I, I think we need to look at what defines uh, pathology, psychopathology. Uh, so both women were talking about uh, a difficulty in controlling this behavior, a sense of yearning, a sense of um, longing to do that that is irresistible. 
They were talking about um, the excessiveness of it, uh, having to do it for hours uh, every day. And uh, they were talking about distress. So this is both in, uh, uh, fun, as, as perhaps eating can be, but you know, eating can also be disorder. Mm. Uh, and, but it's, it is becoming, because of, its, uh, of the excessiveness of it, it's becoming distressful. And worse than all, um, it is impairing uh, their daily functioning. It, uh, from, with, from, I learned from those I talked to that their capacity to concentrate is um, compromised, their ability to work, uh, their ability to socialize, to have a normal family life. Uh, so in, as far as I understand, this constitutes uh, some, uh, you know, a behavior or a habit that is disordered, hmm. is out of control. Okay, Jane Bigelson, so, so you have been uh, talking to other people who share your former condition. How common is this form of daydreaming? You know, we actually just don't know yet. Um, this is, it's not a recognized uh, term in the mental health field. I'm actually working with Ellie uh, to do some research on it. And the first thing we really need to do is to describe it, let mental health professionals know that it's real and learn how to measure it. Um, until that's the case, there's really no answer for how many people mm. have it in the general population, but my guess is it's a lot more than we think. Um, when I was a child and a young adult, I, I mean, I asked doctor to doctor. Everyone, no one had ever heard of it. I could never find anyone like me. Now, if you just Google it on the internet, you're going to come up with uh, thousands or uh, of hits, hundreds of pages of people who are all sharing the same experiences around the world. Mm. Elisa, I appreciate that there's a lot not known about this, at least not yet. But what do we know? What do we know at this point about what causes maladaptive daydreaming? Well, uh, as I said, um, some people do it because they can, because it's fun, and they get, then they get caught up in this habit and cannot give it up. But so, but as I um, uh, surmised earlier, there are often underlying issues. Um, uh, social uh, personality problems, uh, lack of self-esteem, uh, sometimes uh, terrible memories, or uh, gruesome or very, very dull realities. So these are underlying issues that eventually will have to be addressed if these people ever get to therapy uh, to, to treat this problem. Mm. And then there is this addictive behavior. So people are not aware, fully aware or fully in control of the cues that set them off. And they find themselves lost in their fantasies. Uh, another possibility, by the way, is this, uh, there's a one case study out there that successfully treated um, uh, this problem with medication that is usually works for obsessive compulsive disorder. It's possible that the, these mechanisms, these biochemical mechanisms to do with the OCD, the inability to stop to the people that check and recheck and count and recount. So there's something of that sort going on in the brain possibly in this case also. So the, there is some debate about that in the medical community, about whether this could be related to OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, I want to play just a little bit of tape on that point. This is Eric Klinger. He's a Morse alumni, distinguished teaching professor emeritus of psychology. He's at the University of Minnesota. For obsessive compulsive disorders, it is an anxiety disorder and the person either has the obsessive thoughts or engages in the compulsive actions because not doing so would generate anxiety or, or increase anxiety. That doesn't seem to be the case with um, maladaptive daydream. It, it's more being drawn to your daydream because of an attraction to the daydream. Jane Bigelson. D does that resonate for you? Yeah, I mean, it does and it doesn't. Um, I do think there are at least, ev every person's different. For me, I do think there was some sort of a obsessive element. I had to replay scenes in my head over and over again until I got it exactly right. Um, and if I got stopped in the middle, there was some distress there. So I just definitely think there's some like obsessive elements, mm. whether it's a part of OCD that's not yet been described or it's a whole brand new thing. We just don't know. Um, I do want to make a comment, though, um, from an earlier part of the conversation, because I'm starting to hear now from people from all over the world. I believe uh, Dr. Somer is as well. Um, but after doing some a publication of both my own personal story, but also some research, 
hearing from a lot of people who said, you know, I didn't realize I have a problem and now I think I do. And a lot of parents saying, you know, my children are walking around in circles and now they're very worried about it. So I just want to make very clear that if you didn't think you had a problem with it before, you probably don't. And, okay. And for, and for you, Jane, though, for that, what was that personal moment where you you, you recognize, I, yes, I, this is be distressing and, and debilitating and I, and I need help. What finally, what was it that finally prompted you to seek help? I mean, I sought a lot of help. At just young ages, I realized just that I was kind of different than my friends. My friends would be so involved in their daily lives and their crushes and their... And I just couldn't be bothered with that because all I really cared about was getting back to the fantasy. Um, So at some point I told my parents and they kind of laughed. They were like, oh, so you daydream. Um, I mean, they're very loving and wonderful, but they just never heard of this. Um, And I went from therapist to therapist and doctor to doctor and everybody said they never heard of such a thing that I was fine um, and not to worry about it which only made me worry more. Hmm. So you go to a number of experts. They say, don't worry, Jane. This, this is total normal behavior. This happens to all of us. You just suffer from it or you just experience more of it than most of us. Exactly. Okay, so how did you, what finally happened in your case? Because you're a former maladaptive day, yeah. daydreamer. So, so what helped? So eventually after law school, I went to a doctor, a psychiatrist, and I said, um, I know that this is not in the, the, the psych manual, the DSM, um, but I just can't stand the time of this anymore. While I love it, I'm, I'm now working and I need to get this out of my head. And he said, you know what, I've never heard of it, but let's look at your family history. There was a pretty strong family history of OCD. Uh, so he did put me on, you know, a standard SSRI um, called fluvoxamine uh, that, that's commonly used to treat OCD. And within a few months, um, all these characters that had spent so much time with me went away. Mm. Um, not to say that they, I never daydream. I still daydream more than others. But the difference is, is it's in control now. I only daydream when I'm bored. I have nothing else to do. I'd much prefer uh, to be with family, friends, colleagues. Um, so it's it's a very different experience. And Ellie Summer, what kind of treatments? Are you offering those similar kinds of treatments to, you, to your patients who, who have this? Well, again, this is something that we'll have to study and, and, and research before we're able to uh, responsibly recommend the treatment. But as I said, the treatment would be based on treating first the underlying personality issues. And then perhaps we could borrow from uh, um, evidence-based treatment for um, the, the, the treatment for habit, habit disorders or addictions. Uh, to help people identify the cues and triggers that set them off and to adopt behaviors that are incompatible with daydreaming. For mm-hmm. example, calling somebody, talking to somebody, that is incompatible with daydreaming. So in the case of Jane, who got OCD uh, drugs, have you tried that with other the other patients? Have you seen success with those? Uh, no, we have not been treating this uh, this kind of disorder with medication. Uh, we have been working here in this part of the world uh, using uh, psychotherapy. Uh, we, we, are, we are making progress, but we need to document that and to research that. There's, a, there's still a long way until it's recognized by the medical community. But we are getting so many, so many requests from uh, from individuals from all over the world for help. Uh, that it is really important that more medical professionals uh, recognize and acknowledge this problem and can offer uh, some uh, some helpful advice. And, and to that end, uh, Jane Biggleson, um, it, maladaptive daydreaming is, is, is not recognized as a psychiatric disorder. Do you think that it should be? Um, absolutely. Um, and I think that at least it needs to, not only is it not recognized as a psychiatric disorder, but there's reluctance to study it or to learn more about it. Um, you know, I came forward for, for really two reasons. Um, part of me, I was very torn about the decision. This is something I experienced a long time ago. But first and foremost, both uh, Dr. Somer and I are hearing from people from around the world who can't get help because no one's heard of it. So that's one of the main reasons I came forward. And then out of a strong belief that patients need to take the lead, the mental health community, the research community is very reluctant sometimes to look at new things. Um, When we point out these websites to them, we hear a lot of, well, that's not scientific, that's anecdotal. Um, Researchers really need to take a look at what, what, what patients are talking about. 
Um, and, you know, we do get some pushback to, to, mm. to study something new. Well, Eric Klinger, who uh, from the University of Minnesota, who we heard from earlier, doesn't think that this should be characterized as a psychiatric disorder. We asked him if it should be added, added to DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Psychiatric Disorders, essentially the, the Bible. Um, he, here's what he says. The DSM works categorically. And in the case of something like maladaptive daydreaming, it takes many kinds of forms. Uh, the motivation for it varies. It does not strike me at this point as having the coherence that you need for a particular kind of disorder. What you have is a lot of daydreaming and people being unhappy with the fact that they're doing it. Elie Sommer, um, is what Eric Klinger is saying there, is that, is that reasonable? Well, uh, I don't think so. I think that we have something that is qualitatively and quantitatively very different. And I also believe that a similar disorder is already on the DSM. We, uh, Jane and I, came across uh, uh, some studies uh, recently of child psychiatrists who were studying what they what is called in the DSM stereotypical movement disorder. Apparently, this disorder, uh, identified in children, is described as um, pacing and moving, which is a component of, of maladaptive daydreaming, that, as they describe, is accompanied by intense fantasy. So I believe it's already on the DSM. Hmm. And but, uh, well, what difference, just explain to us, like, what difference does it make um, if it is classified as a psychiatric disorder included in the DSM and, and if it's not? Um, well, it, it, if it's classified, um, it will be researched much more. People will be motivated to, to, to raise money, raise funds for research. More knowledge will be accumulated. And if it's on the DSM, a uh, mental health professional will study it, uh, will understand better how to diagnose it, will develop uh, assessment tools and, and, uh, and treatment modalities. So it's very important that it be recognized and classified. And if I, yeah, I was, if I could just add to that, um, it's how you get help. It's why I couldn't get help for so many years. I mean, I remember at age 12 pulling off the DSM off my parents' shelf. My father was a doctor. My mom was a therapist. I read through that entire thing looking for someone like me and couldn't find anyone. And then I spent close to a decade going to doctors, and they were all like, never heard of it. It's not in the DSM. So I want to stop that from happening to other people. Mm, that other sufferers um, of this will, will feel that they're not I also, uh, alone. I also, um, Go ahead, Ellie. Yeah. Yeah, I would also add uh, in, in response to Dr. Klinger that there are many behaviors um, that are normal but get abnormal because of excessiveness. Sleep is normal, but when one sleeps excessively for a day or two, then that's an abnormal sleep disorder. As I said, eating is normal, but that can be disordered. And so is daydreaming. The fact, the fact that there is a normal variant doesn't mean that there is not an abnormal variant, and this is what we're talking about. Mm. Jane Bigelson, what do you want us to take away from as we try and start learning about maladaptive daydreaming? That's a good question. I mean, first and foremost, I want anyone out there who, who's suffering from it to know that they're not alone, that they're not crazy, that people are researching it. Um, what I don't want, though, is I don't want parents of, of children who are uh, pacing in circles like I did to immediately think that their, their child is crazy. Because uh, some people, as just as it, um, Ellie was saying, some people can do this and it's a wonderful thing. But for some people, they lose control and only that person is going to be able to know that. Um, but I just want people to know that, that, there, that there is help out there. And I really want the research and the mental health community to know that they need to listen to their patients. If thousands of people around the world are describing the same symptoms, it's worth researching mm -hmm. and listening to and that. They shouldn't be, no one deserves to be blown off and said, oh, don't worry about it. Jane Biggleson, Ellie Somer, thank you both for your time. Thank, thank you. you. Jane Biggleson is a former maladaptive daydreamer. She's now involved in researching the condition. She was in New York. Ellie Somer is a clinical psychologist teaching at the University of Haifa, and he was in Haifa, Israel. So if you can relate um, to what you've just heard and you think you're a maladaptive daydreamer, you can let us know. You can go to cbc.ca slash the current, click on the contact link to email us and find other ways there to get in touch with us. You can also tweet us at the current CBC.